Hello and welcome to the Sad Crime Channel. In today's episode, I will present to you the events from 2018 that took place in New Ash Green in the United Kingdom. There lived 46-year-old Sarah Wellgreen, who shared a house with her former partner and their three children. Sarah and Ben's relationship ended in 2013, but they lived in the same house for the sake of their children. They met in 2004 through a dating app. Sarah was already a mother of two sons from a previous relationship. At the time they met, Ben was living in Spain, where he was taking a course to become an airline pilot. Initially, it was a long-distance relationship, but later that same year, Ben offered his new partner to move in with him along with her children. The move was supposed to bring many benefits. First, Sarah would be able to spend more time with her sons. Second, she would be closer to Ben. Additionally, the weather in Spain was significantly better than in England. At that time, Sarah was quite an independent woman, as she was raising her children on her own and had a good job at a bank where she worked as a branch manager. Despite this, she decided to take a leap of faith. She decided to move to Spain. However, once she and her children arrived in Spain, not everything went as planned. After some time, she tried to find a job, but since she didn't know Spanish, every attempt ended in failure. Ben also failed to realize his plans. Although he completed his pilot course in Spain, he couldn't find a job in that field. He worked at the airport, but it was a low-paying job and he never managed to sit in the cockpit of a plane. His plan was to work as a pilot and earn a substantial income from it. Sarah didn't have a job, Ben's job brought in much less income than expected, and soon it turned out that Sarah was pregnant. This situation made Sarah miss her family in the United Kingdom even more. Nothing was going as they had hoped. A few months after their first child was born, they all moved back to England, where they settled in the small town of New Ash Green. Shortly after their return, it was revealed that Sarah and Ben were expecting another child. This time, however, it was not just one but twins. When they were born, Sarah's older sons immediately felt the difference in how Ben treated them compared to his biological children. It was noticeable that they were somewhat sidelined. When the children grew older, Sarah started working at the bank again, but after some time she decided to change her profession. She completed a beautician course with the intention of starting her own business. But her relationship with Ben was going through a huge crisis. The couple argued almost every day and the arguments became increasingly intense. They couldn't find common ground anymore. Ben decided to throw his wife and her older sons out of the house. During their absence, he changed the locks, packed their belongings, and took everything to the children's school, informing the teacher that they were not allowed to return to his house. Sarah had no choice but to move back in with her parents. Despite Ben's treatment of her, over time she decided to move back in with him. She was very keen on being close to her children. For Ben, this was also a good solution, not only because the children would have their mother close again, but also because it had financial benefits for him. In 2013, Sarah moved back into the house where she had lived previously, while her sons from her previous marriage stayed with their grandparents. They were not happy with this turn of events and tried to persuade their mother to change her decision, as did most of her family members. Everyone thought it was a bad idea, but Sarah couldn't leave her youngest children. She felt she had to sacrifice to be close to them. She lived in the same house with Ben, even though their relationship was over. Each of them slept in a separate bedroom. Sarah had her own bedroom on the first floor of the house, while Ben slept in a bedroom that had been converted from the attic. This situation of sharing a house when you can't stand to look at the other person is not comfortable, but neither of them was in a good enough financial position to change it. Sarah completed her beautician course and started her own business. The number of her clients kept growing and the business was developing. But in October 2018, she received a job offer that was a big opportunity for her to improve her financial situation. The job offered her higher earnings than before, as well as a company car. Sarah didn't hesitate long it was a huge chance for her to gain independence. So on October 9th she agreed to take the job. She was happier than ever before. When she returned home around 8 p.m., she began calling her family and friends to share the great news. At that time she was already seeing another man, 
She had met him in 2016, and they had been dating since then. She was engaged to him, and he was one of the people she spoke to that evening. They were both very pleased that Sarah would start a new job. They knew it could mean big changes in her life. Changes for the better. But the next morning, when Ben woke up and it was time to get the kids ready for school, he noticed that Sarah was not in the house. She wasn't in her room, nor in any other room in the house. However, Ben didn't worry too much about it. He knew that the previous day had been very important for his ex-partner, and she might have decided to spend the evening with her fiancé. But why didn't she inform him? Ben took the kids to school and then started another day of work as a taxi driver. While he didn't worry too much about Sarah's absence, her sons and friends were more concerned about where she might be, especially since none of them could contact her. Initially, Ben thought Sarah might be with her fiancé, Neil, but soon Neil called Ben looking for her. When Sarah didn't contact anyone throughout the day and the entire following night, her sons and friends began pressing Ben that it might be time to call the police and report her missing, and on October 11th, Ben called the emergency number. The police immediately arrived at his house and quickly found out that Sarah had left her purse in her bedroom, with her wallet and bank cards inside. They also found the keys to her car in the room, and the car itself was still parked outside the house. This was immediately suspicious to her relatives, as they knew well that Sarah rarely went anywhere on foot, or wherever she needed to go, she would drive. The only item she had taken with her was her mobile phone. That was the only thing missing from the house. Ben informed the police that this wasn't the first time his ex-partner had disappeared for a short while. It had happened before. He described her life as a bit strange. She had mental health issues and he knew she was seeing other men. He even feared that she might be cheating on her current fiancé. Hello, I want to report a missing person. Okay, who's a missing person yourself? Sorry, uh, she's the mother of my children. Okay, what's the address she's missing from? Have you got a postcode for me? Lewis, I'll tell you what, Lewis will have more, most of her phone numbers. Okay, okay, bear with want, me. Do you want Lewis's number? I'll take that from you in just a moment, alright? Bear with me. Yeah. Do you know um, Lewis's boyfriend's number and address? I do know his number because he texted me last night, but... Okay. Um, I, I didn't know whether to I, I didn't know whether to really contact him because um, Sarah's got a couple of phones that she left like in, that are, were in her room, okay. and I, I've looked through a phone like one of them didn't have a lock on it to see what was going on sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and one of them I, I didn't have a lock on it, and I've I've looked through that, and I found out that she's sort of like seeing a few blokes sort of thing okay. like. Um, and like, so it looks like she's cheating on him sort of thing, so I didn't... Right, okay, let me just go... Although, although he contacted me, I haven't replied to him. I just, okay. I'm just, I just spoke to Lewis, and obviously okay. I well, said to him, like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be ringing the police today. Remind something. me of his... Is there a reason that she may have gone missing? Anything going on about it might be upsetting, or any, any reason, you know, that she might go missing at all? <sighs> like I said, like... I, I, nothing... Well, obviously, I've... I've I found out about like uh, sort of seeing quite a few blokes sort of thing. Um, I can only guess really. Like I know she was assaulted at the weekend. Was that reported? Uh, yeah, she uh, she um yeah, a job by by an employee at work. Bear with me, all right. So, I'm sorry, it's just no, quite. Right, it's just, right. I'm just trying to think. It's quite. She's got. Yeah, no, she's no, got quite a complicated life, like, and um, it's just a bit messy, really. Everyone hoped that Sarah would be found, especially since three days after she was last seen, it would be the 13th birthday of one of her children. She was a very dedicated mother, and everyone who knew her was certain that she would never miss her child's birthday. Searches for the woman began. After one of her older sons posted about her disappearance on Facebook. The people living in New Ash Green began to unite to help in the search. Nearly half of the residents joined in searching the area. Sarah's sons, who lived an hour's drive from where their mother lived, also came to help as much as they could. The only person who seemed the least interested in these searches was Sarah's former partner, Ben. While the residents gathered and participated in the search for his ex-partner and the mother of his children, he was busy organizing his son's birthday. At that moment, it was the most important thing for him. 
Needless to say, this raised great suspicion among everyone. But it wasn't just Ben's behavior that was suspicious. When Sarah's older sons wanted to meet with their half-siblings to check how the children were coping without their mother, Ben didn't allow it. He wouldn't let them enter the house, and later took all three children to his aunt's house. The police questioned Ben, but he had no idea where Sarah might be. He claimed he had been sleeping in his bedroom the night she disappeared. It wasn't until the morning that he noticed his ex-partner was missing. The police noted that Sarah and Ben's house had quite a few surveillance cameras, but unfortunately Ben informed them that the system hadn't worked for nearly a year and wasn't working on the day Sarah went missing either. This was unfortunate, as it could have provided investigators with information about when Sarah left the house or if anyone visited her that evening or night. This could have been very helpful in searching for the 46-year-old. The search for Sarah continued, but investigators began to suspect that something bad might have happened to her. If she had simply left her home, sooner or later some trace would have been found. But she hadn't used her bank account, logged into her social media accounts, or used her mobile phone. It had been turned off on October 10th at 4 past 4 a.m. The police feared that Sarah might be dead, and they had a feeling that the person responsible might be Ben Lacomba. Three days after Sarah's disappearance, Ben was asked to hand over his mobile phone to the police for examination. He refused, saying it was too late that he was very tired and needed to sleep, and that he still had something to do on his phone. He promised to hand it over to the police the next day, perhaps even bring it to the station himself. His behavior was increasingly strange. The next day, the police couldn't contact him by phone. His phone was always off. Ben showed up at the station only in the afternoon, handing over his phone to the police. It was later revealed that this was not the same phone Ben had been using the day before. Surveillance footage allowed investigators to establish that in the evening, after the police had left his house, he didn't go to sleep. Instead, he got into his car and drove a few miles to another town, where he threw the phone into a river. The next day, Ben went to a store and bought exactly the same model of phone as his previous one, inserted his old SIM card into it, and later handed it to the police. On October 16th, Ben was arrested on suspicion of murdering Sarah Wellgreen. He was held in custody for 48 hours, during which he was repeatedly interrogated. In total, the interrogations lasted seven hours, and throughout this time, Ben did not say a single word. No information was obtained from him at all. The investigators also had no evidence linking him to Sarah's disappearance, so after 48 hours, he was released. As I mentioned earlier, the camera system in Ben and Sarah's house had not been working for nearly a year so the police could not obtain any recordings from it. They started checking if any neighbors had outdoor surveillance. The neighbor living next door to Ben had such cameras, and fortunately they were working perfectly. They were asked to provide recordings from that period, and they brought the investigators many surprising details. Firstly, the recordings showed that no one came to Sarah's house that evening or night. No one left the house either, at least through the front door, which was covered by the camera. The second piece of information from the recordings was that Ben always parked his car in the same spot, in the well-lit parking area in front of the house. On October 9th, he parked his car elsewhere. He left it behind the house, in a poorly lit area, out of the reach of the neighbor's cameras. Why did he decide to park his car in a different place that day? The recordings also revealed that Ben was lying about his cameras not working. When the police asked about his surveillance system, Ben said it hadn't worked for a year. But on the obtained recordings, the lights on his cameras could be seen flickering, indicating they were working on October 9th. The lights stopped flickering at exactly 11.45 p.m., indicating the cameras were turned off then. Who could have turned them off? Only Ben, as he had installed all the cameras, and the control system was in his room. This was very suspicious and put Ben in a bad light. But thanks to these recordings, the investigators could establish one more crucial fact. At around 2 a.m. on October 10th, Ben's car could be seen driving by. He worked as a taxi driver, and his red Zafira had distinctive markings on the doors, differentiating it from other cars of the same make. This discovery led the police to review other neighbors' recordings. They wanted to find out where Ben went that night, but unfortunately he left the town and headed in a direction with no surveillance cameras. 
He was last seen on cameras two miles from his home, but then his trail went cold. He reappeared on the cameras over two hours later, returning home. He was back by around 4.30 a.m. This completely contradicted his claim that he was in bed all night. Now, as I say, you're here on suspicion of murdering her. We believe she may be dead, and that may be at your hand. So, did you kill her? So, I'm not clear at the moment, Ben, whether you're just trying to think of an answer or whether you've decided not to answer the question. Later, one of the children testified that they woke up that night and tried to find one of their parents, but neither mom nor dad was home. The next morning, when Ben took his kids to school, his car was in a state indicating it had been used at night. There were mud marks on all the tires, even though the previous day when he returned home from work, it was spotless. As a taxi driver, Ben had to keep his car clean. Why was it so dirty? Did Ben drive on some dirt roads that night? The car didn't stay in that state for long, as right after taking the kids to school, Ben went to a car wash to clean it up. The search for Sarah continued, with efforts focusing on a five-mile radius around her home. The residents of New Ash Green remained highly involved in the search, but Sarah could not be found. The heavily wooded area around the town with numerous places to bury a body worked against them. The story touched many people close to Sarah, and they vowed to keep searching for her body until they found her. Meanwhile, the police searched the house where Sarah and Ben lived, they found a rather large shovel, which was relatively new but had already been used. Ben explained that he needed it for his front yard garden. However, the investigators doubted his explanation. It didn't seem that such a large shovel was necessary for planting a few flowers in Ben's front yard. Most of the yard was covered by a concrete walkway and artificial grass. However, the shovel was perfect for digging a grave. On December 20th, 2018, Ben Lacombe was arrested again on suspicion of murdering Sarah. Everyone wondered why he would do such a thing. After all, Sarah was the mother of his children. However, when the investigators took a closer look at their relationship, they discovered that right after Ben threw Sarah out of the house, along with her older sons, he went to court and testified that she had abandoned her children, asking for custody. Sarah no longer had the chance to see her children with Ben. She was in such shock that at first she didn't know what to do. She didn't expect Ben to be capable of something like that. But eventually, when the initial shock wore off, she started to act. First, she returned to the house where her younger children and Ben lived, leaving her older sons with their grandparents. At the same time, she decided to fight for custody of her three youngest children. In 2016, she achieved the desired success. The court awarded her custody of the children. That same year, she met Neil, and her life began to improve. However, despite her promising relationship with Neil, they did not dare to move in together, always fearing what Ben might do. Sarah was afraid he might take her children away again. Therefore, she continued to live with him under the same roof. But when the opportunity for a new, better-paying job arose, Sarah began to hope that she would be able to buy out Ben and no longer have to live with him. On October 9th, after signing the employment contract, she informed Ben of her intentions when she returned home. She had already applied for a loan from the bank, so it was only a matter of time before she could buy him out. But for him, it meant not only losing the house but also losing his children, who would undoubtedly stay with their mother, leaving him to see them only occasionally. 
he couldn't allow that to happen. Investigators also determined that just a few days after Sarah's disappearance, Ben went to court to try to regain full parental rights. The mother of his children had been missing for just a few days, yet he acted as if he was already certain she would never be found. The trial in this case, which began in October 2019, was not easy. Despite investigators reviewing over 20,000 hours of surveillance footage and checking nearly 3,000 locations using tracking dogs, drones, and sonar, they could not find Sarah's body. However, they tried to prove in court that, despite this, it could be assumed she was dead. During all this time, she had shown no signs of life, and all the collected evidence pointed against Ben. He stood to gain the most if his partner were no longer alive. There was too much evidence against him for the jurors to believe in his innocence. After less than four hours of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Ben was sentenced to life imprisonment. He will be eligible for parole only after serving 27 years. To this day, Ben has not admitted to the murder, nor has he revealed the location of Sarah's body. However, Sarah's sons and several residents of the town where she lived have no intention of stopping the search. They spend every free moment studying maps and considering where else they could look. One of Sarah's sons moved to Kent to continue the search locally. Everyone still hopes that one day they will finally find Sarah's body and be able to bury her. As a family, we miss Sarah every day. There is no bandage big enough to repair the wounds that is left behind the premature death. We will not, however, allow Ben Lacomba to destroy our lives. Thank you for listening to the end. Take care. Goodbye.